Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 7th edition Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game rules by Chaos. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try very hard to stick to language for all ages, listeners should know that this podcast may include mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc. that may bear resemblance to entities living or dead is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your keeper. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I'm your keeper, Keeper Michael, and we return to Horror on the Orient Express tonight with a special spotlight episode on one of our investigators. And so if they will introduce themselves, we'll get started. Hey, this is Miranda, and I play Maggie Bellinger, who's having a little bit of a crisis moment right now. Indeed. Having just really survived Venice by uh, her own powers, perhaps, and the assistance of some sedatives, uh, she's been sort of brought to Trieste the next day where she's awoke and she's been hustled into a hotel and seen some of these realities shift around her. She maybe is a little unsteady. Uh, but that morning, the the next morning, the group had collected for breakfast and Paul had suggested that it would be a good idea to confer and maybe talk over some treatments that you and had talked previously before wanting to sort of understand what might have happened what memories you might be you uh, maybe have lost a little bit yeah so we'll raise the curtain tonight inside the confines of Paul's hotel room and so you all have this block of conjoined rooms and one of them down at the end of the hallway portion here is Paul's. It's a corner piece, so it's a little bit larger than some of the other rooms, but it does afford the two of you sort of the sitting area. And Paul has gone ahead and, and he's gotten water and tea from the staff there to make sure that you have what you need, that you're, you're comfortable. And he's moved a couple pieces of furniture here in the room to give the two of you a more direct line of sight and he goes through all the perfunctory things he apologizes it's really i i, I uh, it's sort of the, the first time i've done this so uh, at least d- d- directly like like this in the um uh in well, the real world <laughs> oh you don't uh, this wasn't part of your medical training well uh you understand that we, we we worked with each other and we worked with patients mostly patients that i worked with um Ms. Bellinger were um not nearly as um, well put together as you. They were not prepared as much for society as you are in most days. And so not all of them were completely responsive. He sets a pad down. So we we worked through certain training pieces, uh, tr- trials, uh, preset questions and answers to sort of get the um, sessions lubricated. Well... I I suppose I've been talking never hurt anyone, so regardless of your experience, I'm sure that this will be fine. Well, I'd sort of like to start. He picks up the pad and looks almost professorial for a moment. You see him in his pocket, like tuck out these reading glasses and tries to, to put them on. He fumbles a bit, but yet gets them curled around the backs of his ears and says, uh, I'd like to ask a couple of questions about what you do remember when it comes to Venice. You remember going down underneath the Basilica? Oh, yes, I remember that. And what happened? Well, uh, not much. We uncovered what we were looking for the leg, but we uncovered that it was not there. And I heard from... Just over overheard because... We all stay so close that you ended up going to a doll factory after then? Oh, yes. Uh, we we had caught a lead, um, I, I think based on the name, that it may have something to do with uh, Jeromancy. The, the doll maker had something to do with the leg, so we hmm. headed there. But it turned out that uh, that was a sli- kind of a dead lead. Um, the leg oh. was not there. 
there were many other legs there, but not that one particularly. And also, they're not making dolls anymore. They're making prosthetics. Oh, certainly, certainly for for the war victims. Now, I understand that, um, and this is just my perceptions, of course, overhearing some of the way the group talks with one another. Um, do you ever feel that the group fails to listen to your opinions? Well, now that you mention it, I do suppose that that could be the case from time to time. I, I mean, Mr. Fraser and uh, Simon, they both have very just strong personalities. Lady Elizabeth as well, but she's a reasonable person and and will listen to other ideas, but there there are some strong personalities in the group. He nods and scribbles some things down on his pad. And so, a- after you left the doll factory, am I right in thinking that the group went directly to this, um, wherever you recovered the leg from? They said something about a tower? Oh, uh, yes, a, a clock tower, I believe it was. Yes, we went directly there. Uh, it, it it was a strange trip. Uh, there was a, a bridge where we, of course, the black shirts were everywhere, and we, we tried our best to avoid them, but, but couldn't. And there was kind of a, a kerfuffle on uh, on the bridge and I remember taking a, a photo in the water. I saw something in there. You took a photo in the water or you took a photo? Well, I took, took a photo of something in the water, of the okay. water. Yes, yes, yes. It was at uh, Richard's suggestion mm. that I take a picture of it. Ah, uh, yes. He's always being so helpful. The photo that you took, have you developed it yet? Oh, no. Uh, Richard was thinking that we could do that uh, once, uh, well, possibly today. Hmm. Interesting. And do you remember what you saw in the water? I don't think I can quite describe what I saw in the water. I'm not sure entirely. Hmm. The photo would reveal it, yes? Certainly. It would probably be great for my book. I tend to agree. So... You moved from there to this clock tower, and from what I have been able to gather from what Simon has mentioned, it seemed to be a stressful time. Apparently so. It was was quite a a long trip up, and it, it did catch fire, so I would imagine that would be very stressful for some. Hmm. He sort of chats a few more notes down you can see it the pencil he has here is is really continuing to build sort of speed interesting i vaguely remember that someone was uh, trying to get me to jump from the the tower i wanted to jump off of the top hmm that would be a quite the feat um, the clock tower seemed to be at least from what well, from what i saw while we were Coming down the Grand Canal, some of those clock towers were very tall. It sounds like a very dangerous thing. Yes, that's that's part of why I'm so confused. I remember not much. I remember wanting to jump. Something wanted me to jump and, and fighting with Mr. Fraser about it. Something wanted you to jump. Was it a voice? What was leading you to the edge to jump? I can't really tell. It seems like it was a, a feeling, or I'm not entirely sure. All right, so let's walk back a moment. There was a kerfuffle you said at the bridge. What sort of situation? This, was this before or after you saw the thing in the water? It was around the same time. I, it's hard to uh, describe because it all happened so quickly. Uh, something with the they wanted to see our I- identification papers and I believe me and Richard maybe also got through just fine but the the kerfuffle was really with Mr. Griffith and Mr. Fraser and mm. the black shirts of course and oh, oh one got uh, pushed into the water oh bumped into the water so was the photo you taking was that photo that you took of, of this black shirt in the water I don't 
No, I don't think so, but it was at that at that time. Hmm. He sits up for just a moment and then reaches towards the teapot. Would you like some tea? Oh, uh, yes. Sure. Slowly pours it out and then reaches out and hands you the cup and saucer. Sits back with his yellow pad afterwards and resumes. Does Paul also take tea? He does not. Hmm. Indeed. What I'm seeing here is a bit of disassociation from the events. You use some words here that I find somewhat curious. When describing some events at the clock tower and some of the events here at the bridge, you use the words apparently and I suppose as if you weren't there. And so what that tells me is that something before that event triggered something in your brain and you're disassociating from that event. And that could be the brain's natural desire to protect itself, to protect perhaps a memory that is painful, perhaps something that is shocking. I know that just from my experience with the group here that you seem to run pleasantly sometimes a foul of situations which are stressful. And in other times you run maybe so not so pleasantly. The description of the Opera House in Milan was fairly graphic. If you think back in your mind now to that point on the bridge, after this skirmish, this rough housing that the black shirts did with Mr. Fraser and Mr. Griffith, there was a voice there that I see here in my notes, and that's of the professor. And he's asking you to take a picture of something. And you do. I wonder if you just take a few moments and think about that experience. As this description's going on, Paul's voice seems to be taking over tonally the room. You start hearing him in a different tone, begin to focus in on what he's saying. Work back with me, if you would, to when you take your camera out. Envision lifting it up. You have to see through it to take the picture. Provided you're going to follow his direction. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have you make a power roll. Okay. And see if we can unwrap. All right. Very powy. Mm, Yes. That's 52 under 75. In your mind's eye, you envision the camera coming up. And you see the splashing in the water. And you hear in your left ear Richard's voice. You hear him say... Maggie, my, 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 there's, there's something in the water. I'm, 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 get, get your camera. Where at? Where, Richard? Where? Where, 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 where the guard fell in. There was a, a, a thing with teeth and, and eyes. You hear him with that vocal intonation and you, the urgency, the surprise, the excitement. It is sort of always at the core of Professor Courtney and his, um, well, his want for new experiences. And you grab the camera and you lift it up and you see... There's something in the water there that he's pointing at. Something you hadn't seen as well before, but he's showing it to you. And there's this green undertone to the water when something large begins to come out of it. And as that focusing lens and the and the camera uh, glass comes forward to your, your face and you get ready to take the picture... There is this, on the other side of it, this open maw, which is far larger than anything you have ever seen previously. It makes no rational sense at the width nor the sheer number of teeth inside as it tries to swallow one of these black shirts. And your eyes sort of drift down through the lens as you feel the mechanical press of the uh, click button uh, and the mechanism inside the camera begin to whir to do their magic. And you see the two sort of spindly human arms that exist on the lower body of the fish as it steadies its prey to take the bite. Then you hear a ticking clock and you gasp. And you see Paul across from you, his 
pencil has stopped. And you're back in the hotel room. And there's this clamminess to the underside of your hands. And you realize that your heart rate has gone up. And your chest is sort of heaving from whatever you just experienced. Paul, it it was horrible. There was this creature monster being in the water. It was it was eating the black shirt. I so just in in innumerable teeth. I don't I don't think we should develop the picture. I don't I don't think I we should look at I don't think anyone should look at that. It was consuming him. This creature from beneath the Grand Canal. Yes, it was in the water. I I couldn't see all of it, but I could tell it was it was absolutely massive. I see. Mm. And so this would be the inciting event. He scribbles something more. This, Miss Bellinger, could be the event that started this chain reaction of the brain, your brain, protecting itself. And in doing so, it may have given you a a different path to walk. He sort of taps his lips with the eraser. After this event, you continue down to the clock tower, you said. Oh, uh, yes. Do you remember how you felt when you got to the clock tower? I, I felt fine. I felt wonderful. I felt strong. Like nothing could stand in my way. Hmm. Interesting. So sort of a, um, sort of a self-empowerment, a, a, a grandiose feeling, yes? Yes. Like that the clock tower would just crumble before me if I willed it. It's interesting because in some cases, ones I've read, it's a reasonable response that when someone survives a horrific incident, that they become filled with the belief that their survival has shown them how strong they are. And this sense of strength, this grandiose nature, while a delusion, can assist them in continuing their misadventures down that pathway. You see, I contend that this inciting event and this grandiose feeling are connected, not only for the moment, but they played out for some time. I heard many of your companions comment fortunately, that you'd sort of become wrapped up in yourself a little bit, that you were not acting like yourself. And this makes sense, because that sense could last for some time. With you, it seems we were perhaps lucky that we were able to um, get you out of Venice and get you into some treatment. Do you think that's also why I wanted to jump off of that building, Paul? No, there is something we are not seeing yet, Miss Bellinger. We will find it. There is something, a memory you have of that moment, that span of time. Because from what I see here, just based off the notes, you don't particularly remember what happened at the clock tower. Not just, not just the way up, but anything in between. You go from being outside to being upstairs at the top of it. Many things may have happened in between. We've not yet recovered those portions. And it may take time, or it may not. It all depends on your willingness. He takes a drink of water. I would certainly like to feel like myself again. Having these gaps in my memory is quite troubling. Hmm. What if it were to happen again? What if I were want to, you know, jump in front of a train or off another tall building again and I I don't even know why it's happening. This was the concerns that I had when I expressed them to the group on our way on the train. And so while I would be happy to treat you, I would be remiss not telling you that I shared those same concerns with Lady Elizabeth and with Mr. Fraser. That we should come to the heart of these matters so that way we can be sure that you are safe to continue. How is your tea? It's fine. Good. So, on the way up the clock tower, do you remember any sort of conversations you might have had with the fellows in your traveling party? Do you remember anybody who didn't go up all the way? 
who maybe who was in front or behind you? Can you remember any touchstones from the event? What did the space was it lit or unlit? It was very dark hmm. and and seemingly very difficult to to traverse. More difficult than you would think the mere set of stairs would be. I, I remember us having quite a, a hard time getting up them, especially as we got closer to the top. Hmm. Interesting. Very well. But you did ascend. I we did make it up eventually, and we we all must have made it up because we were all up there. You speak of Lady Elizabeth's malady, the the cane use. Oh no, she um she did stay down. At the bottom. She never came upstairs? Would I have remembered if she had come upstairs? You're not sure. I don't think so, yeah. Your your memory at this point, as we have patched together, is a little muddled as to who was there. Mostly because you were very much at a single directional... Oh, yeah, exactly. I'm going and getting that leg. I don't seem to remember her coming upstairs in particularly. All right. He jots another note down. Hmm. But you mentioned that uh, Mr. Fraser was there and at the top and he grabbed you? Well, he was trying to stop me from something. Mm-hmm. I remember I, f- I figured it out. I figured it out before anyone else did where the leg was. I put those pieces together and I knew exactly where it was. And I remember him wanting to s- stop me from something, but possibly from the jumping. Hmm. And so you contend then that he was going to stop you from the jumping, but that sounds to me like you had figured it out. You'd figured whatever you were, perhaps the position of the leg or where the next piece was. And it was something born of that then that you moved on. You were ready to leave. Perhaps. Oh, yes. Um, I mean, generally once I find... Once we find one of these pieces, then uh, it's we we just continue on with our our journey. Mission accomplished. Hmm. Have you found all the pieces, Miss Bellinger, so far? Oh, oh, so far. I mean, we haven't found all of the pieces, but uh, we have found. I've found. We have found uh, the the pieces that we've been looking for. Yes. What I mean to say is that. Have you been the one to collect each piece? Yes. And this is something you pride yourself on. Yes. To an extent, I I think we both know that I've suffered some ailments uh, increasingly and I I I don't think that the others should have to deal with that. I think it's best if if they stay in one piece. Mm. I see. And so Let's walk down that road for just a moment then. When you take these pieces on, we have seen, rather directly, indirectly, you have developed problems in uh, your left arm, the elbow specifically, which I have treated you for. We have seen you have some rather unfortunate chest maladies, some, some mucus, which is I'm still testing, unfortunately. And we have also, at least a little bit, seen that there has been a leg issue now, yes? Yes, I have had some pain. Hmm. Tell me, why do you feel it's necessary for you to take on these pieces? I feel that it's, it's what I should do. It's my, it's my, my purpose and it, it protects the others. I'm, I'm, I'm strong enough. I can handle the pain. Pain is no problem. The pain is no problem. Do you hear it echo in the room? But it might be for others. Think of of Lady Elizabeth with further leg problems. I think we should concentrate on you for just a moment rather than Lady Elizabeth. Pain is no problem. Do you think maybe this is where it stems at? Your statements, the grandiose nature that you took on during this time. Do you think maybe the root of it is truly that you believe that you are strong enough to take the pain and that it is better in that communal way? And furthermore, is it perhaps maybe that the pain is a welcome reminder of you doing your duty? Oh, 
Oh, absolutely. I know that I can handle it better than anyone else in our party, I think. So truly then, you are best serving when you are taking that pain for others. Well, yes, I believe so. Interesting. Make me a power roll. Okay. That is a 70 under 75. You get a mental image, a memory that floods up from this. And that is the racking pain that you took in your leg when you grabbed hold of the soldier's leg, the leg of the piece of the simulacrum. When you removed it from the soldier, you remember that sort of shooting pain that ran down from your thigh into your knee and the buckling that it did. What's interesting about it is when this memory comes to you, it comes to you with a sensation which your brain did not register at the time, or you did not register at the time, but the memory reminds you of it. And that is the satisfaction of receiving the pain. That you had accomplished your goal and you knew that you could find the leg. And furthermore, when you took it, you took the pain and the pain itself is what gives you that satisfaction. The fact that you were right, that you were doing your job. But you were not prepared in this memory to deal with the fact that you're getting some sort of satisfaction from the pain. That's a strange feeling, even if it does sort of feel right. Uh, Paul, yes, it's it 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 does make me feel well. It makes me feel good to 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 find these pieces to take on that burden myself, and the the pain is. Oddly, a remind, it's a reminder to me that I'm, I'm doing the, the right thing and that I'm, I'm better f- for it. I'm, I'm the, s- the strongest member of our party and, and the pain is what reminds me of that. Hmm. It's kind of pleasant, honestly, in a weird way that you would associate these positive feelings with so much hurt. I think... Strange is a word we should be careful about using because we don't want to walk the road to negativity with this. I think that finding these things out about oneself is important and that it could make you a stronger person, provided that you're willing to continue to stay safe while experiencing these things. At Charrington, we dealt with patients that sometimes had this sort of feeling. We had some rather ecclesiastical members of our community. There were several of them that were interested in showing the staff how much they could put up with from the orderlies and would actually go as far as to incite orderlies to punish them. Now, most of our orderlies had been trained to deal very carefully with these patients, but there were some who like the men we met outside who were much more interested in the use of the truncheon and patients being who they are. They're very perceptive. Many people view the infirm or the, those under the afflictions of, of mental maladies. They view them as um, less than perceptive. It's unfortunate, but they see and hear and experience um, many things that we do. And those members, those patients picked out those staff and did their best to incite them to get what they wanted, which was to be beaten. And so, I don't think this is uncommon or strange at all, and I don't think we should use that language. I think we should use it to further your strengths. Oh, and how would you suggest that I I go about, about that? Well, that purely depends on what you're open to, Miss Bellinger. He slips the page. There are ways to elicit pain responses from the body when necessary and to prepare oneself for the day. It might be a way to reorganize your thoughts or to adjust your attitude before the day. Yes, Paul, I'm, I'm listening. What would be your suggestion? One of the ways that we stopped the patients at the hospitals from inciting the orderlies, was to give them a time of the day that they were allowed to engage in certain activities. And you think that morning would be best for this? 
I think the morning is the best time. Mostly because it can help you adjust for the day. Oh, yes, that does make sense. Perhaps before breakfast. Now, this might seem a little strange, and that's okay. When you were younger, did you have any brothers or sisters? I don't know much of your personal history. N- uh, no, I do not. I grew up with a, a large family, and my father was never shy when it came to making sure children were disciplined. And so he utilized a a paddle of sorts. And Paul goes into his doctor's bag and he withdraws a piece of wood, flat, no more than four inches or so wide and about eight or nine inches long. And he places it on the table. A very similar version to this we used at staff sometimes orderlies would use at Charrington. I managed to recover one before we left and I'd like you to consider utilizing it. Oh. Think of it like a muscle massage. Oh. That makes sense. I could just use it, I guess, to whatever uh, strength feels best. Yes. uh, the, um, The wood here is fairly soft. He leans over and hands it to you by the handle. There's nothing um, sharp, nothing to concern yourself with as, as, as far as um, anything that might make you uncomfortable. You take it and feel that all of the edges are sanded and really soft, although there's a, a firmness to the wood here. Do I have to worry about it breaking, Paul? That all depends on how hard you're prepared to use it. Yes, I understand. Very well. In my experience with such things, we would start in the morning and we would start with a very orderly amount. So that might be a duration of time. It might be a number of uses. This all, of course, depends on your personal preference. But I would recommend at least 10 to start. You say we. Does that mean you're going to be present too, Paul? Well, I could as as your physician, if you would like. But I feel that it might step over the line. Yes, I'm sure I can handle it on my own. Of course, if you can't, perhaps you would be willing to engage another member of your party with it. Perhaps they could assist you. Yes, I was thinking if I needed to, I could ask Richard to help. I think that's a splendid idea. Again, if not, if uh, Professor Courtney is unwilling or needs further descriptions or our understanding tutelage I'm happy to help him in that regard as well okay uh, I will I will, in that in that case if that were to happen I I will let him know and I would suggest if I could if you would allow I would recommend that it's use only on certain portions of the body obviously the um the larger sections of the torso and the legs are best or he sort of begins pointing to like the major muscle groups and then gives you a a, a simple instructions of where not to hit people mm-hmm. because it could elicit more pain and actually do real damage. Yeah. What's tough about that is the allure that when he tells you that, <laughs> oh, really? That's so sort of your brain sort of mixes a, a little bit. This tea is very strong. It's that it's that don't touch this. <laughs> Correct. Yes. It's a little chart. Yeah. It's the 19th century version of... You always want to touch the don't touch those parts. Wait. So, um, I think that 10 uses should be enough. And I think it would be important to count as a method of making sure that all 10 are done. Yes, of course. You wouldn't want to cut it short or... It's simply a method of making sure that the process is done from start to finish. I Yes, I understand. All right. It continues writing. Now, let's get to the final portion of this, if we can. After the leg, after the pain, and after your success, you were drawn to the clock tower windows in an attempt to leave via the window. Could you tell me anything you might have heard or seen which would have drawn you 
to those places. Is Maggie getting a memory yet of what she's seen? Yeah, you start you start sort of forming this cloudy image of a person mm-hmm. at the edge of the window or at someone who's walked in the window. At first, it's a cloud, like a gaseous cloud that comes in through the window. And then your brain begins to glean and pick through the imagery until you see that revolutionary era French coif of hair, the resplendent uniform of the Comte. And it's really this first point where you see the connective tissue of who was drawing you to the window. Yes. Yes, Paul, it was the the Comte Fenelik. I saw him there, and I've seen him before other times, too, in the fog and at night when I was I was trying to see how the pieces fit together. This isn't the first time I've seen him, but this is the first time he's wanted me to to come with him to, to leap from the building. I find this interesting, mostly because it seems against purposes. If we believe, if we contend that the Comte wants all of the pieces, yes? Yes. You falling out of the window, presumably to your death, or into the air under some sort of mystical spell work, he sort of seems to scoff at the very notion of it. It seems antithetical. The other two pieces are at the hotel. Getting that one piece doesn't even get him what he needs. And we haven't even found the other pieces yet. Correct. And so I wonder then, what was his true purpose of drawing you to the window? Paul, this is just a guess, but do you think that it was to in uh, further separate me from the rest of my party? I think that is one possible, possible motive. I have been doing some reading while we have been traveling, and I'm very concerned that the Comte may be something we are not yet seeing. We know he is old. We know that he is something which we cannot explain. But after reading over some of the notes I had taken at Charrington of that event where he was supposedly found at... I hasten to say this, of course, Miss Bellinger, because I am not one who is going to just fall headlong into silly folklore, but the news report from Milan of Arturo Focacci the next day said that he was ripped apart. The people in Venice, the gondoliers, there was one who was ripped apart and killed. Is it possible that Comte is something more than a man perhaps something from folklore. I think that's almost entirely possible. I mean to finger one specific thing. Oh? Have you ever heard of a vampire? Uh, Yes, I have heard heard some of a a vampire. Dracula and Nosferatu. We have seen many things which are a little difficult to explain. At least I have seen reports of them, as I have only been present for a few encounters. If we walk down the road of supposition, is it possible that the Comte is a vampire? Well, that would be uh, assuming that vampires are real, though at this point, I don't... I, there's a, not much that I doubt uh, about what is real and what is not real in the world. You've just explained to me within the past 20 minutes that a large monster sits in the Grand Canal of Venice. And so I seem to feel like if that can be corroborated with the picture you've taken, we're sort of down the road of that idea anyway. Yes, that that is, that is understandable. And if that is the case through those logics and reasonings, then I do suppose that he, he could be a vampire. And so if we presuppose that he is a vampire, then what... Is he after? Right? What what specific thing does he want? Well he doesn't it doesn't seem to have a whole a whole body right now. What do you mean by whole body? Well himself, he he seems to to, to merely uh, come and go in the fog. Hmm. If he comes and goes in the fog, is it that he can only keep his mortal form around for so long? Possibly he may want more power to be able to 
to to stay for longer. That's certainly one one reasoning. Well, in Bram Stoker's Dracula, Dracula travels to England to feed on the blood of Lucy. And despite the efforts of her hapless suitors and Van Helsing, Lucy dies and she comes back as a vampire. I don't want to alarm you, but do you think perhaps the Comte wants you to, in the same way, feed on your blood? Well, I possibly, but um, he does have a job for me currently, so I would imagine that he wouldn't do that. He hasn't threatened me yet, and in fact, he, I, I get only pleasant feelings from him, but I suppose that's also the same for Dracula. Yes, uh, in, the book, in the book it is well known that Dracula can uh, mesmerize a, a talent he uses on many. And so perhaps there is some sort of power that he has. I, I bring this up because I think it is a way for us to work through your daily routine. Well, yes, because if we identify him as something, then it does give us something to deal with. Certainly. And it gives you an opportunity to have a focus to fortify yourself against. And so now, when you do your daily routines, you could use it as a focus to, to show that you need to be stronger the next time you meet him. Yes. But also, what if I do, I do still want to meet him again? Well, certainly. You want to meet him again so that way you can show him that you're in control. Oh, yes. Yes. That makes sense. So let's agree upon this. I would like you to engage this morning in this adjustment routine. Are you comfortable with that? Yes, I believe so. Would you care to do it under my eye or would you prefer to do it alone? Oh, I think I'll I think I think I'll try on my own first, Paul, and if if I need assistance, I will let you know. Please do so. He finishes up scribbling. And then while we're here in Trieste, Let's be very mindful that the Comte may be here or coming here next. For if um, Professor Courtney's ramblings are anything close to the truth, there is some clue here, some reason why Professor Smith uh, needed us here. Well, yes, and we've we've seen the Comte in, in ev almost every stop we've made. Mm. First at Charrington, and then in Milan when I was putting the pieces together... Mm -hmm. Now here we've seen him a number of places. Specifically then in Milan, he came directly to you. Yes, it was when I was trying to see if the arm could attach to the the torso. Hmm. He seems to have fixated on you, Miss Bellinger. Well, I, I think I'm I'm fine with that. I actually think it plays to our advantage in the grand scheme of things. If you are the one he is after... For either to assist him in collecting the pieces, or perhaps he has you for some other sort of uh, unfortunate reason in his um, in his sight, then we should tell the group. Everyone should know, so that way that the group can plan for it. Yes, I understand. Perhaps I will discuss it the, with them uh, today. It's not a bad idea. Perhaps um, what I like to do with some ideas is to run them by a single person before presenting them to a wider group. Perhaps you and Richard could discuss it, get some sort of uh, agreement to see if the idea seems valid. Yes, of course. He His mind is the most pliable, I feel, of the rest of the groups. Paul sort of tilts his head a little bit. Pliable? That's an interesting expression. Well, the, with just his experience with the, the device... I think makes him open for m more ideas. Hmm. You might be right. He is a rather curious fellow, so I've seen. Y yes, he is. He's also not well. You are aware of this? Yes, I am. I'm doing my best to help him recover, but he insists on moving too much. He's talking about going to a another museum or checking on a clue today, and I really hope he decides to take it easy. He sort of sets his glass of water down. You've absentmindedly finished the tea, picks up his notes, and uh, closes his doctor bag. Is there anything else I can help you with while we're here? Any other questions you have for me? 
No, I don't believe so, Paul. Splendid. He stands up. I suppose I will go administer my treatment, and if mm. if I need anything further, I, I will let you know, Paul. He nods. Of course. And uh, walks towards the door with you, or opens the door, and smiles and says, uh, I'm going to uh, collect a few of the things I need for the tonic for Mr. Fraser. He's uh, obviously not feeling well. He didn't sleep well, I heard. No, I don't believe he slept very well at all. And while I couldn't find any sort of fever or anything like that on him, he's he's not right. He's washed out of all the color that he's supposed to have. Not like him to not be up. First thing, too. Oh, well, yes, of course. He's usually tending to all of us. Well, even the caretakers need care at some point, yes? <laughs> yes. Mm. Well, have a splendid day. I'll be here um, seeing to the... Uh, the wounded as of sorts, and if uh, you need any other assistance, please do not have to sit. Of course, have a good day, Paul. You too. He shuts the door. You take ten steps or so, and you're down at your room. Maggie enters the room. You close the door, and we will draw our story for the day to a close. So, uh, thank you, Miranda, and uh, for uh, bringing Maggie along for our little spotlight episode. Of course. Uh, we have some changes to make <laughs> on her care sheet but we'll do those we'll do those offline it's fine but you're at this point considered cured yay of your um your um uh, insanity for the better part of the day until something else crazy happens to you or the rest of your party totally developed that picture and slip right back in that's right that's your god mode picture you just turn it over <laughs> But we will speak to you all, listeners, next week. I sincerely hope you understand that was not good enough. I don't know what more you expect of me. I did everything I could. She's a wreck. I mean, <laughs> I've, I've seen worse, but... Not much worse. Stop. Stop sniveling. We have no time for this. You will work your magic on her until she is better. I cannot have Miss Berenger not available to me. She is the only competent one among them. You mean, you mean malleable. You mean someone you can take over. She deserves so much better than you. Enough of your whining. Enough of your sniveling. They escaped me in Milan and Venice. Never again. You will continue to assist them in recovering the pieces. And perhaps when it is all recovered, you will get what you wish. I, sh I should never let you out. We... Here I stand.